This video is on identifying zeros of polynomial functions. If p of x is a polynomial function, the zeros of the function are the x's when p of x equals 0. In other words, what is x when y is equal to 0? What are the x-intercepts? To find the zeros of a polynomial function, you need to solve the related equation. So take the, take the function and replace f of x with 0 and solve that equation. As we saw with quadratic functions, one way to do this is by factoring. So let's take a look at an example here. We need to find the zeros of f of x equals x cubed plus x squared minus 12x by factoring the related equation. Then we need to graph the function. So the related equation is x cubed plus x squared minus 12x equals 0. Notice that I've replaced f of x with 0. So I can factor this first by taking an x out, taking out a greatest common factor of x. And then the binomial that's left in the parentheses can be factored into x plus 4 and x minus 3. And then setting each of those factors equal to 0 gives me zeros of x equals 0, x equals negative 4, and x equals positive 3. So that would, those would be the zeros. And now let's graph that function. So what that means is those are going to be my x-intercepts. So I'm going to have an x-intercept at 0. I'm going to have an x-intercept at negative 4 and an x-intercept at 3. So now what I'd like to do is figure out what does the graph of this look like? In other words, what is my end behavior? Whoops. There we go. So as, f, as x approaches negative infinity, what is f of x doing? And as x approaches positive infinity, what is f of x doing? So I'll notice that my leading coefficient is 1, so that means my leading coefficient is positive. This is degree 3, so that, that means that as my x is getting smaller, so too is my y. So it's going to look something like that. So f of x is also going to approach negative infinity. And as x approaches positive infinity, so too is y. So f of x is going to approach positive infinity, and then somewhere in between, and I don't need to be super precise about this, it's going to look like that. You could actually plug this into your calculator and get some values for in between there, but something along those lines. The key thing is knowing where the x-intercepts or the zeros are and knowing what the end behavior is. The factor theorem describes the relationship between the zeros and the linear factors of a polynomial function. It says that if x minus a is a factor of the polynomial, I'm sorry, it says that, that x minus a is a factor of a polynomial if and only if the value a is a zero of the related polynomial function. So for example, if x equals negative 5 is a 0 of the polynomial p of x, then x plus 5 is a factor of the related polynomial. Notice basically all you did was they, we added 5 to both sides and made it the linear factor equal to 0. Let's take a look at an example. Actually a couple examples here. We need to write a cubic polynomial function in standard form that has zeros of 1, negative 1, and 4. So that means that x equals 1, x equals negative 1, and x equals 4. So what I'm going to do is rewrite each one of these as an equation that equals 0. So subtracting 1 from both sides, I get x minus 1 equals 0. Adding 1 to both sides, I get x plus 1 equals 0. And subtracting 4 from both sides, I get x minus 4 equals 0. That means that my polynomial is going to equal x minus 1 times x plus 1 times x minus 4. Now that's what it would look like in factored form, but it's asking for this in factored form. I'm, I'm sorry, that's factored form, asking for it in standard form. So I know that x minus 1 times x plus 1 is x squared minus 1. And using the distributive property to write that out, I get the polynomial x cubed 
minus 4x squared minus x plus 4. So there's a polynomial in standard form that has zeros of 1, negative 1, and 4. We can also do this using i. So here we need to write a polynomial in factored and standard form that has zeros 2, negative 2, i, and negative i. So that means x equals negative 2, x equals i, and x equals negative i. So that's going to give me factors of x plus 2, x minus i, and x plus i. So my polynomial in factored form would be x plus 2 times x minus i times x plus i. And actually I could clean that up a little bit. And actually I really should get rid of the i's here. So x plus 2 and x minus i times x plus i is x squared plus 1. Because remember i times i is negative 1, but negative i times um, positive i, negative i times positive i is going to give me a positive 1. Now in standard form, if I were to multiply that out, I would get x cubed plus 2x squared plus x plus 1. So that's a polynomial that's going to have zeros at negative 2i and negative i. If a polynomial has a repeated factor, this creates a multiple zero. So for example, in the polynomial f of x equals negative 1, x minus 1, quantity x minus 1 squared, times x minus 3, times x minus 4, x minus 1 is a repeated factor because that's really x minus 1 times x minus 1. And there are multiple zeros at x equals 1. Since the factor x minus 1 appears twice, we say that 1 is a zero of multiplicity of 2. In other words, there are two zeros at x equals 1. And here's what a graph of that looks like. You'll notice that there is a zero here at negative 3. I'm sorry, at 3, a 0 here at 4, and then you'll notice that the graph just touches the x-axis here at 1, and that's what we, instead of it crossing the x-axis, just touching the x-axis right there is what creates that multiplicity of 2. So let's take a look at an example here. Find the zeros of the function f of x equals x cubed minus 4x squared plus 4x, and state the multiplicity of the zeros. To do this, I'm going to go ahead and I believe that's factorable, so let's go ahead and factor that and start by taking out a greatest common factor of x. And the trinomial that's left in the parentheses there is actually a perfect square trinomial, so this factors into x times x minus 2 squared. So this is going to have zeros at x equals 0, and it's also going to have a 0 at x equals 2. And since the factor x minus 2 is squared, that's going to have a multiplicity of 2. If the graph of a poly polynomial function has several turning points, it can have what we call a relative maximum or a relative minimum. So in other words, it's not the maximum value of the function over the whole function or the minimum value over the whole function, but just a relative kind of in that region. A relative maximum is the y value at an up to down turning point of the function. So here is a relative maximum and you can see the functions and increasing and then where it starts to decrease that point right there that turning point is a relative maximum because kind of in that region that's the highest point. A relative minimum is going to be kind of down here in the bottom of the valley as the function is decreasing and then it turns and starts to increase. That is not the minimum value of the entire function but it is a relative minimum just kind of in that area. So let's take a look at our last example here that says find the relative maximum and relative minimum of the graph of f of x equals x cubed minus 9x and then round to the nearest tenth. To do this, well actually so I can um, 
I can actually get an idea of what this graph looks like by factoring it. I'll take out my greatest common factor of x, and that leaves me with a difference of squares. So that's going to be x times x plus 3 times x minus 3. So if I were to graph this, I'll just do a, a simple graph here. I'm going to have zeros at 0, and then I'll have one at positive 3, and one at negative 3. And since this is a cubic and my leading coefficient is 1, my graph is going to look something like this. So I'm going to have a relative minimum right here. And I didn't draw that piece very well. Let me turn that again. There we go. And somewhere right there, I'm going to have a relative maximum. But it's hard for me to figure out exactly what those points are, so I'm going to go ahead and graph it on my calculator. So here's the HP prime, and I want to be, be using the function app. I'm going to go ahead and do that. And I am in symbolic mode, and let's go ahead and put that function in. So that's x raised to the power of 3 minus 9x. Okay, hit OK. And then let's take a look at a graph of that by hitting plot. And actually it's a little bit steeper than the way I sketched it, but you can see that you have zeros at negative 3, 0, and positive 3. Here's my relative max, here's my relative min, and I'd like to know exactly what are those points. So to do that, I'm going to place, where is my, let's see, I'm going to place my cursor kind of in the area of this over here. Don't have to be exact, and that's not going to be my exact minimum value. I'm going to go to Menu, and select Function, and you'll see that one of the options here is called Extremum. In other words, what are the extreme values? What are those maxima or minima? Okay, so when I select that, it's going to identify the extreme value kind of in that region. So here it says that I have an extremum at the point x equals negative 1.7 approximately and y is equal to about 10.4. Okay. Now if I want to get the other one, I'm going to go ahead and put my cursor kind of close to my relative minimum here. Hit function again, hit extremum, and you can see I have a relative minimum at uh, 1.7 comma negative 10.4. So I'm going to have a relative max at that was at y equals about 10.4 and that was that point right there and I'm going to have a relative minimum at y equals, that was this point down here, approximately negative 10.4. So in this video we took a look at how to identify zeros of polynomial functions by factoring. We also took a look at how to write a polynomial function given its zeros, and then how to find the relative max and the relative min of graph.